Hey everyone, welcome back to a new video. Before we get into the stories, I need to give a trigger warning for story number three for sexual assault. I'll have timestamps down in the pinned comment and I'll have that story labeled if you want to skip over it. As always, you can send your stories to southerncannibal.com if you want to share your own. This is a disturbing one, so get ready. All that being said, let's get into the stories. And remember to always stay hungry. I was 12 years old when a local woman was bizarrely abducted. It's assumed that she was murdered too. I didn't know her personally, but her tragedy changed my life. I grew up in Henderson County, Kentucky, where the abduction occurred. It was a quiet area full of friendly people. One summer evening, my mom arrived home and she sent me to bed. It was earlier than my usual bedtime. Unable to sleep, I snuck into the hallway and peeked into the living room. She was watching the local news and crying silently. It was strange seeing mom cry. She was a strong, independent woman who rarely ever showed her emotions. She kept the volume low and sat crisscross in the front of the TV. I held my breath to hear the reporters. They spoke of a young woman who was sunbathing by a local river. A male witness observed her abduction. The witness, for some reason, was watching from a distance, likely being a creep. He watched as a male snug behind her, snatching her by the hair. The man then dragged her into the woods while she clawed, kicked, and screamed. They didn't say she clawed, kicked, and screamed, but one might imagine that's what happened. The witness, probably terrified, called the police. The next morning, after a sleepless night, Mom sat me down. We talked about life, death, and evil people. It was our first adult conversation, opening my eyes to the real world. Henderson County was different that day. Everyone's southern glow faded, and I didn't see their usual smiles. We were in the supermarket strolling through the aisles, whispering conversations about the abduction were all I heard. Each aisle contained a separate set of middle-aged women gossiping about their theories. My mom purposely avoided them, turning her card around each time. When it was time to check out, the cashier looked happy to see mom. They embraced with an awkward hug over the counter. My mom introduced her as her high school friend. I don't remember her name, but she was kind. The kind cashier began speaking about the abduction. My mom glanced at me and tried avoiding the topic, but her blonde friend kept talking. She spoke of the missing girl as if she was a friend of mom's. I don't remember what was said exactly, but I asked her about it on the car ride home. My mom broke down telling me that the missing girl was her childhood best friend. They had a falling out and they hadn't spoke for years. Her behavior made sense. She was grieving. Later that night, mom was called to work. As much as she hated leaving me with my grandmother, which was my shithole dad's mom, she had no choice. She dropped me off around 5 p.m. She was only covering a few hours, so I didn't mind spending time with grandma. Her house was near a small country-style park. She often let me run across the street to play. She kept an eye on me from a distance through the kitchen window. There were usually neighborhood kids playing freeze, tag, or football, but not that day. It was completely vacant. I made the most of it. I played on the swings and went as high as I could. I closed my eyes and imagined flying. I looked across the street and waved at Grandma. Seeing I was safe, she smiled and walked to another section of the house. I closed my eyes again and when I opened them back up, I was no longer alone. A red truck pulled into the parking space about 50 feet from me. When its engine shut off, I waited for another kid to open the passenger door. 
I waited several minutes to no avail. Finally, after watching the truck for about five minutes, a scraggly looking man stepped out of it. From the moment he opened the door, we maintained eye contact. He smiled weirdly. I didn't know what a vibe was at the time, but I knew that he had a weird one, whatever it was. He yelled over to me. Hey, I'm lost. You want to help me out? I didn't say a word. His smile disappeared, and he looked around excessively. Uh, are you broken? Did you hear me? I just nodded my head. I looked over to the kitchen window, but I didn't see my grandma. Where's your parents? When I didn't respond for a third time, he became annoyed. Come on, I'll take you back home. You shouldn't be out here alone. He began walking towards me. My heart stopped when his walk then turned into a hustle. I clearly remember the sound of his baggy blue jeans as he then power walked towards me. To this day, I still have nightmares about that specific part. In my dreams, however, I can't scream. I try, but my voice doesn't work. I also can't run. It's like I'm just moving in slow motion. He usually grabs me and covers my mouth, dragging me to his truck. I'm here typing this story, so obviously I was lucky. As he approached, I stood up and I screamed so loud that it stung my throat. He stopped in his tracks and he looked perplexed, almost impressed. I'm not sure, but I think he actually expected me to do nothing, to sit there frozen like a game of freeze tag. Not three seconds went by when I then heard my grandma's voice. I don't remember the words she screamed, but it made the dirty looking man take his eyes off me, which was a relief words cannot describe. He chuckled, calmly lifted his hands as if to say, just trying to help, and then walked back to his truck. And when I say walk to his truck, that's exactly what I mean. And frankly, it was the scariest part of the experience. He casually slowly walked back with his hands in his pockets, staring at grandma the whole time. Once he drove away, I ran back to grandma and I clutched her tight. She called my mom, who was rightfully furious and terrified. She picked me up within five minutes. Mom made me speak to a police officer later that night, but honestly, I don't remember any of it. I just remember her being frustrated and calling the cop useless. She was a respectful woman who respected authority, but under the circumstances, I'm sure she had a reason to be upset. Since it's a real case with a real victim who I would like to respect, I won't dive into specifics. However, the possible identity of the man who abducted my mom's friend was released. He was found dead soon after. Suicide, I think. I'm not just saying this, but his description actually matched the man who approached me at the park. I'll never know for certain whether it was him or not, but I have a feeling it was. I'm sure with enough research I could find a picture of the suspect and compare it to the scraggly man at the park, but truthfully, I'd rather not know. I know it's a crazy story, and I know you may not believe it. Hell, I don't blame you. However, if nothing else, I really hope you research the case and pay respects to the victim and her family. My mom's gone now, but she'll forever be with me. Writing about my experience is therapeutic, and it really reminds me how good of a mom she truly was. So, for some context, this was close to about five years ago when me and my friend were closer. I was hanging out with my friend who we'll call Mia, and we were at her dad's house like we normally did. But today, we went with her dad to help this old lady out with her plumbing, and we played with her grandkids. Let's call him Jake and his brother Mike. We were hanging out in his room playing board games for a few minutes until we got bored of them and then decided to play hide and seek. Now, this wasn't a house that was easy to seek in since it was so big so we played outside. Now, the backyard had a fence around it, a few bushes and a small pool, not many places to hide. 
About four rounds later, since I was no good at hiding, it was my turn to seek. Standing inside the back door to where I couldn't hear or see them hide, but quick access to get out. I had checked the pool since it wasn't filled, and I found Mia, then behind the bush, and I then found Jake and Mike. Finally, we were getting tired and sweating since it was the summer, so walking inside, I was the last one in line. Slowly walking inside, I had heard movement, but I didn't know from where. So slowing down even more to see if it was just my imagination, I turned around. Nothing. Continuing to walk to the door, I then heard a loud voice then say, You forgot about me. Now, knowing it was only me, Mia, Jake, and Mike, this scared the hell out of me, because they had just walked inside the door and were already getting drinks and ice pops. I stopped right by the door and looked around, not saying anything until I saw a tall man by the fence, who then stood up and started waving. Thinking it was the neighbor, I said hello to him. Hello there, he said. My blood froze, and it was the same voice from when I was walking inside. He was just standing there on the opposite side of the fence. Who knows how long he had been there watching us since we had been outside for almost an hour at this point. I had heard Mike yelling for me to come inside the house, Hey, are you coming? Your ice pop's gonna get eight. When I got inside, I had told my friends about the man. But when Jake heard about it, he said no one had lived in the house behind them for five years. Still to this day, knowing that someone was probably watching us play outside for the hour we were out there, still really gives me the chills. We never told the adults because we know they already thought we were imagining things or making things up since we were just kids so it was pointless. But still, that experience was really creepy. I need to give some pretty big trigger warnings for sexual abuse, sexual grooming, self-harm, and also mentions of suicidal thoughts and actions. I've told my story publicly about my experience with my dad, and I've been a stronger advocate since. I want to help others feel less alone and let them know that this is not something rare. We can only stop it by talking about it. Before you read any further, please know that this is my personal experience with sexual grooming and sexual victimization. I'm not making any accusations or assumptions. I'm strictly just sharing my experience. I will not be using any names of victims. I will refer to the two that I experienced the grooming and manipulation with as friend A and friend B. I'm from a less than 5,000 population town in Arkansas. Firstly, a little backstory. Up until age 11, I have almost zero memories of being home. I have distorted memories of Christmases, birthdays, and other happy times. But I cannot even tell you how I got home from school or what I did while at home until I was 11. This was the age I had my first best friend. She moved into our neighborhood, and we instantly became close friends. Friend A was the person I wanted to be. I was a couple of years younger, and I didn't have an older sibling, so I idolized her. She was athletic, had several friends, loved good music, dressed stylish, etc. Overall, she was extremely outgoing. We hung out after school almost daily, either at her house or mine, talking about music, sports, boys, you know, your typical middle school girl talk. Fast forward a few years, she stopped sharing her interests with me, stopped coming over, stopped inviting me over, and finally, stopped talking to me altogether. I was sad, but I just assumed it was because she was older and had made other friends her age, so I just accepted that and carried on. We also went to different schools, so we didn't have that in common either. Leading up to that, however, I noticed huge personality changes in friend day while we were together. She became very isolated and reserved. She always wore a hoodie with the hood up. She also started talking to me about her stalker and how he was harassing her via text, email, phone calls, leaving notes on her vehicle, and also watching and spying on her. I didn't know what to do with this information, 
So I told my dad. At the time, my dad and friend A were having what we were led to believe were counseling sessions. So I let him know so that he could help her. Little did I know, it was my dad that was her stalker. When I told my dad about friend A stalker, he rolled his eyes and he told me that friend A is a compulsive liar and just saying things like that for attention. He said that he would make sure she's safe. When they would have their sessions, I would be told by my dad to not be at home so that I didn't interrupt them. I was even told by my dad to not ride my four-wheeler by friend A's house because her parents didn't know she was receiving counseling sessions and they would be upset. I had no idea this was how he was getting her alone with him. I had no idea that while I slept, my dad would take friend A out of my room and take her to the recreation room of our home for their sessions. I remember one year I wanted to go to a concert with friend A. We were between 15 and 17 at this time. My dad insisted he'd be there for our protection. I assumed he meant because that concert was known to get rowdy. When we got inside the venue, friend A sent me a text that said, he's here, referring to her stalker. She didn't talk the entire concert. Keep in mind, these were our favorite bands and she just wanted to leave the crowd and sit at a bench. At the time, I was really irritated because I wanted to be in the crowd. I thought she was afraid of the mosh pits, but my dad was with us, so I assumed we were safe. I was wrong. I now know that this was because my dad was using the crowds as an opportunity to have his hands on friend A without it looking suspicious. I didn't speak with friend A again until college, and then not until August, when I reached out after learning the truth of what happened. We have rekindled and are healing together through this. I can't help but feel guilt. I know it's not my fault. I was a child, but I can't help it. Looking back, the signs were all there. I just didn't know at my age. While all of this was happening to friend A, it was also happening to friend B at the school we attended. Yes, Mills High School. My dad was hugely popular at our school. He was seen as a cool coach slash teacher and the students flocked to him. Just like with friend A, my dad started telling friend B that he was concerned about her and wanted to do counseling sessions with her because of the dreams she was writing about. My dad collected dream journals from all of the students as a part of his curriculum. I won't say anything else about friend B because I don't want to reveal her identity. I've shared my experience with some, but now I'm sharing publicly. I was scared of what would happen if I spoke up. I still am. I feel naked, vulnerable, and so exposed. I hate it. However, if my experience helps just one person, it's worth sharing. I keep waking up hoping this is a dream. I keep asking why. Just fucking why? Why my dad? Why the man that I looked up to? Why my hero? Why? Why? I'll never get an answer. And I know that. All I can do is take what I know now and heal from my experiences. While hopefully helping others heal along the way. How am I doing? I don't know how to answer that with consistency. Some days I feel like I could take on the world. Other days I don't feel like I can cover myself up enough and I just want to hide under my covers and cry. All day I know that I'll be okay. I've got a great support system, a great counselor, and limitless possibilities with what I can do with my life and my experience. I don't know what happened to me. As I previously stated, I don't have memories of being home before the age of 11. I can tell you that I've had nightmares my entire life, some of which include being held down and being sexually assaulted in my childhood room with my eyes covered so I can't see who's on me. I still wake up out of sleep sometimes grasping for air and also drenched in sweat with no recollection of what my dream was. I used to self-harm daily from ages to 12 to 18. I've been suicidal once going as far as writing out my goodbye notes, going to the place where someone would find me before my family, 
and then staring at that pistol, contemplating why I couldn't pull the trigger. This was when I was 21. I've since gotten into counseling and on the right medication. I no longer feel suicidal, and I haven't since I was 21, nor have I hurt myself since I was 18. I'm working with a counselor to recall my childhood memories and heal from whatever happened. I'm going to be okay, but I know it won't happen overnight. Healing is a journey, not an event. Thank you for taking the time to read my experience, and I hope like hell anyone who has gone through something similar knows they're allowed to talk about it whenever and wherever they want. We're all in this together. Hi everyone, I should have done this a long time ago whenever I covered a video like this. But if you or anyone you know is being sexually abused, call the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673 or go to RAIN.ORG, R-A-I-N-N.ORG. Again, if this is happening, please seek help. And to all the survivors who send in their stories like this, thank you. I will always give you a voice to share your stories. Have a good one, everyone, and stay safe out there.